John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Hi there, welcome back. My name is Stephen King. This is my friend John Noe. We are putting on a continuing Bible teaching series called Greater Than We Believe. And we are taking you right now. Uh, we've been doing this for a couple years now. We've, we've broached many subjects. Uh, they all are supposed to turn our attention back to Jesus Christ because he is the subject as, of the one that is greater than we could believe. But we've got Right now we're talking about the term eschatology, which uh, has the meaning of uh, end time prophecies and um, whether that's important for us to understand. There's a lot of confusion. People, A lot of people avoid revelation like the plague because they don't understand it. But mm -hmm. um, John has been uh, putting on uh, a series now where he talks about how he went to a local church in Anderson, put on a 13-week seminar talking about this and um, I, we're basically having a seminar ourselves <laughs> by going over the same thing and so last week we where we started the where he set the ground rules mm -hmm. for one of the mo the first most important one was sola scriptura which is the bible is the authority period and the number one two rule which is so important was everything's to be done in love and you see uh, uh, a lack of that a lot of times when people love to seem to love to argue scripture and argue theology so um, he set the basis for it now John this is uh, video number 123 mm -hmm. and it is under the ongoing subheading the divine solution which is what we're important in church sit in the divine solution is unifying end time views and so what we want is some harmony <laughs> not arguing and uh, today's video is called why so important so Why so important? Take it and go. <laughs> we are now into week two of okay. the Madison Park Church of God uh, seminar series that was titled Unraveling and a Biblical Synthesis of Competing Views and then the Explanation Unifying One of the Most Divisive Elements in Recent Christian History. Mm -hmm. So we're addressing, before we get into the views themselves, which we're, we're getting there in about week three, four, five, mm -hmm. <laughs> in that range, uh, who cares? Yeah. You know? So what? It, it's it's like this divisive arena is kind of like the old saw that says two men look through prism bars. One mm. saw mud, the other saw, saw stars. stars. Yeah. I mean, we can look at the same thing and say, this yep. means this. And, no, it means this. Yep. <laughs> you know? So that's what we have going on here. Yes. Uh, to a major degree. So let's look, Stephen, in this video and the next seven reasons why your view of the end is so important. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. In other words, why does it matter how you believe the end of God's plan of redemption, which is what this book is all about, mm -hmm. is God's plan of redemption. Uh, whether or not you believe uh, the end of God's redemption has or will happen, hmm. in other words, past or future, yes. if the world is going to end soon hmm. or never, hmm. if the rapture is going to happen next week hmm. or never, hmm. uh, if Jesus is coming back soon sometime or never, hmm. <laughs> If asked, many Christians would say your end time eschatological view is not important. Hmm. And it certainly is not a factor of salvation. Right. Okay. After all, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works or what by one's eschatological view. This is correct. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I'm not yes. making this stuff up. Right. Okay. Uh, so they've come up with terms like panmillennialist. Hmm. You know, however it pans out, <laughs> that's fine with me. Yeah. Or pro millennialists. Whatever happens, I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> These are actually cop outs. Yeah. And and from people who simply do not want to follow the scriptural injunction, uh, such as First Thessalonians five twenty one, test everything. Yes. You know, hold on to the good. But masses of Christians and others are simply confused. 
by the current complexity and contradictions of end time views, or they are turned off by all the arguing, you know, about it. Hence, they dismiss the importance of eschatology, claiming, if the experts can't agree, why should I bother? Yes. Or why should I bother even trying to figure it out if, they, if the experts can't? The ones with all the degrees. Right. Did, did I, did letters I mention Letters after your name, yeah. <laughs> letters after your name. See our last video. Uh, okay. Uh, they say, it's, after all, it's a non-essential mm -hmm. for salvation, right? Uh, it's only appendage. No, it's not. It's about the whole, yes. whole Bible. Only appendage to the Christian faith. Therefore, it's not significant or essential for my daily life. Oh, yes, it is. Yes. We're going to show seven reasons why here in just a minute. Uh, it's majoring on minors. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Who cares? Okay, Stephen. So I'm going to suggest that there are seven key reasons uh, and pertinent issues for why your end-time view or eschatological view or non-view is so important. And as we will see... Eschatologic, eschatology's influence and impact is vast. Hmm. It touches and encompasses and has implications for many other areas of theology, for practical living, the nature and mission of the church, and much more. So there are broad differences in understanding and opinions within the church in each of those areas. Mm -hmm. So let's see, and see if you will agree or disagree with me and Stephen. Uh, and these come from my book, Unraveling the End, uh, from the first chapter there. Uh, so if you're ready, number one reason your view is so important is your view of the future determines your philosophy of life. Life, this is right. It makes a huge difference for your family, for others close to you, and if there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Yes. If you have bought into the popular ideas that Christ will soon return and this world is going to end, these beliefs will affect how you and your family think, mm -hmm. pray, work, save, Plan, invest, commit, etc., 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 or don't commit. Yes, to do certain things in the present, especially things in the present that will influence things long term mm -hmm. and have long term payouts. Remember my story about my daughter? Mm -hmm. That was the last last video that we talked yes. about how she thought she would never have to make plans to go to college or get married because of this stuff. Yes. Okay. Eschatological ideas do have consequences. And for most evangelicals, Stephen, their worldview is this. We are living in the last days. Mm -hmm. uh, wh so why fuss? Why fight? We're on the next flight. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of here, baby. I mean, you know, that's it. And if that's your worldview, yeah. you think that doesn't affect your present? Absolutely. The presence? Yes. Number two, how much of the Bible is involved? According to the late R.C. Sproul, in his article in Table Talk Magazine, 1999, says, it has been argued that no less than two-thirds two two-thirds of the content of the New, excuse me, New Testament. Okay. It says, it has been argued that no less than two-thirds of the content of the New Testament is concerned directly or indirectly with eschatology. And some estimates are made by experts at, say, 25 to 30 percent of the whole Bible. Mm. So it's not a peripheral issue or a minor no. issue at all, is it? As Brian Daly uh, suggest in his book, The Hope of the Early Church, he understands that there is an eschatological dimension to every aspect of the Christian faith and reflection. How many? Hmm. Every one. Every one of them. Yes. Because it touches so many of the central truths of faith. Yes. So it's not a minor issue, no. is it? Not at all. All right. The fact is, your view or non-view 
of eschatology dramatically affects your understanding or misunderstanding or lack of understanding of many other aspects of the Christian faith. For instance, it impacts points number three through seven mm -hmm. that we're going to go to next. <laughs> Point number three. How much salvation do we currently have? Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if Christ has to come back and finish the job, how much of the job has he finished? Yes. Mm -hmm. How much salvation do we currently have? The whole Bible, as we have seen, is concerned with man's problem mm -hmm. and God's solution. Mm -hmm. And that impacts the area of salvation. Yes. Does it not? And the final outworking of that redemptive solution for those alive and for those dead is what salvation and eschatology are all both about. Mm -hmm. But depending upon your end time view, your answer to this question will vary. The question again is, how much salvation do we currently have? Right. Your answer will vary from some, some. most, all. Hmm. For example, Steve, if you and I were to die tonight, would we go to heaven? Mm -hmm. Not if Jesus hadn't finished preparing that place. That's right. And come again to receive That's right. his first disciples. That's right. Not alone you and me. That's right. If he hadn't come again to receive his first disciples to be with him, and you may that you may be where I am, that's in heaven, John thirteen thirteen and thirteen thirty six and fourteen two through three. Well then if you and I were to die tonight, if that hadn't happened, heaven's not open yet. Hmm. According to the popular futuristic end time views, this coming has not happened yet. Hmm. Number four. How much of the kingdom do we currently have? <laughs> <laughs> Same question. Same question. According to your eschatological view, your answer will vary from none, mm -hmm. and the most popular view is none. Yes. To some, to most, to all, to all minus some parts. Yes, it is. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> I'm just reporting the facts. Yes. And the fact is, the kingdom of God was a central teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, and at the heart of his earthly ministry, it was also the very essence of New Testament Christianity. Unfortunately, today, the kingdom no longer is a central teaching of his church at the heart of its ministry, nor Christianity's very essence. <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> Look out, folks. Sadly, what has happened and what has changed is the kingdom of God that Jesus was presenting as a then and there present reality has gotten caught up in eschatological midair. Why so? It's because the coming of the everlasting form of the kingdom of God is an eschatological event. Yes. And the most popular Christian view, dispensational premillennialism, claims that the kingdom Jesus presented was postponed hmm. and withdrawn by God when the Jews refused to receive the type of kingdom Jesus was presenting and rejected him as king and crucified him. But if that view is correct, why does, Stephen, inspired scripture written some 20 or 30 years later? Mm -hmm continue talking about this kingdom as a then and there present reality? Good question. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And a whole bunch of other scriptures solidly make this point. Acts 1-3, 1, 1-6, 1, 8-12, 14-22, I'll, I'll post them on the subscripts. A whole bunch of scriptures make this point throughout the New Testament. That, it's, that the kingdom is still, it wasn't postponed, wasn't withdrawn. Hmm. The next most popular view, amillennialism, says is one of uncertainty on this point. Its proponents cannot decide what to do with the kingdom. To illustrate this absurdity, for example, let me share with you from my book here an experience I had with an amillennial professor who was lecturing to us at, even, at the Evangelical Theological Society mm. on evangelical uh, on this issue. What, what, how much of the kingdom do we currently have? 
and he said this. He said, the amillennial, or I say this, the amillennial speaker at one of the few conferences on the kingdom that I've ever uh, uh, heard about or attended was addressing the kingdom and rightly, uh, pro, and rightly proclaiming how Jesus during his earthly ministry presented the kingdom as a then and there present reality. Right. So far, so good. He also rightly proclaimed that the kingdom was at the very heart of Jesus' ministry and the very essence of New Testament Christianity. So far, so good. So good. Uh, then he dropped the other shoe, <laughs> eschatologically, so to speak. But, he continued, all we have today is a foretaste of the kingdom. It's here, but only in an already not yet sense, mm. in some sense, at which point I raised my hand mm -hmm. and he called on me. I agree with you, Dr. So-and-so, on Jesus' presentation of the kingdom as a then and there present reality with its significance in the, and, and its significance in, the, uh, New, in New Testament Christianity, but where did Jesus or any New Testament writer ever say that the kingdom was only there in a foretaste? Hmm. Hmm. Or already not yet. Hmm. No, I didn't do the hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> or only in some sense. Yes. You could have heard Stephen pins drop around that room as the speaker stood there in silence and so, slow, slowly but nervously stroked his beard. That's what professors do when they yep. don't when they don't know. <laughs> mm, that's a good question. <laughs> Stroking his beard, and after a few awkward moments of contemplation, nodded his head and responded, "Okay, that was George Eldon Ladd." Now, I don't know if you know who George Elton Ladd is. We quote him every now and then. Mm -hmm. But he's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Whether, so, uh, not only are those expressions about the kingdom both non-scriptural and unscriptural, amillennialists cannot define in what sense the kingdom is only here in a foretaste, mm -hmm. or in an already not yet, or in some sense. They don't have any idea. They are uncertain. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like too solid of a faith to me, does it? When you subscribe to something like that. A third view, post-millennialist, or post-millennialism, assures us that while the kingdom is mostly here, and it is each individual's responsibility to advance it, and by the way, that's the view of the kingdom that our forefathers of the faith came yes. to this country with, uh, but it'll only come fully in the future at Christ's return. But what did Jesus or any New Testament writer say about the kingdom only being here or mostly here? Or only coming fully in the future? Nothing. Not a word. Not, zero. Nada. Nothing. A fourth view, preterist secessionism, professes a consummated present and spiritual kingdom here and now, but says little about it in its writings. Hmm except to maintain that significant parts of the kingdom, the miraculous charismatic gifts of the Spirit, have been withdrawn by God. It's called secession theology. Yes. How then do we explain that the kingdom to be brought in by the Messiah would only increase? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 6, or Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, and Luke 1, 33. Wouldn't this withdrawal of something significant as the, as the miraculous charismatic gifts of the Spirit, wouldn't that be considered a decrease? Yeah. And, and, what scriptures, and, and what does Scripture say about the kingdom only being here being a spiritual kingdom? You know, that adjective is never attached to that noun. Hmm. Never. Why not? Because that, because that would not would not be accurate. Mm -hmm. It is spiritual. Yeah. But it's more than that. Mm -hmm. So spiritual kingdom is not scriptural language for that reason. Too restrictive. It's too restrictive. In my opinion, when the evangelical church in America, Stephen, lost its kingdom orientation and worldview post A.D. 1948, mm. When the prominent, that's when the, I believe the prominent uh, eschatological view changed from that of postmillennialism to premillennialism and the atom bomb and, you know, all that kind of stuff. We started losing the culture. How much of the culture do you think we've lost since then? Here in America. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially lately, huh? Yeah. 
as we have increasingly lost the culture, we've also increasingly lost our children out yes. of the church. Six to seven out of every ten by the age of 23 is the latest statistic I've seen. And in my opinion, once again, the only way to stop uh, and, and begin reversing this downward trend is by reclaiming and restoring the validity of the kingdom reality and worldview just as Jesus brought, taught, and manifested it to the church and the world. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. This reclamation would also necessitate a reclaiming of the full gospel. Hmm. What's the gospel? Hmm. Well, for Jesus, it was the kingdom of God. For the yes. first three years of his three and a half year earthly ministry, he never even mentioned salvation, and he only met till the three year point, and then he only mentioned it to a few close associates. Mm -hmm. Several prominent theologians have also bemoaned the kingdom's denigration from the gospel, and the gospel being reduced to only that of individual salvation. Mm. And much of the church today subscribes to that. You ask them what the gospel is, and they, they say salvation. Mm -hmm. Dallas Willard, in his book that, that I, I quote a lot, and you know I've taken the, the, my title, The Divine yes. Solution, from his divine conspiracy, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of picking up where he left off, he, he terms this kingdom efficiency, quote, the great omission, and the primary reason why the church today is so weak. Mm -hmm. Daryl Guter, in this book, his book, The Continuing Conversion of the Church, calls it reductionism of the gospel, or gospel reductionism. Robert Lynn, in an article in um, Breakpoint Magazine, laments the gospel we have claimed, we proclaim has been shrunk. Hmm. Well, these are theologians. This is not just me. Hmm. So I'm not making this stuff up, sadly, but not surprisingly. With these kind of popular but kingdom deficient beliefs floating around, is it any wonder why so few Christians today take seriously Jesus' basic admonition to what? Seek? First, the kingdom, Matthew. Why seek it? If the popular view is they didn't even hear, how can you seek something they didn't even hear? This is true. How would you know when you found it? <laughs> And by the way, ditto is for the amillennial. You know, yeah. if it's only partially here, but somehow sore, and in some sense, but we really don't know what sense it is. How, how would you know when you found it? You wouldn't. Likewise, it is any wonder why so much of the modern day church is far from being a manifestation of the kingdom. Rather, as Harold, Gerald Bray talks about in, in this book, The Kingdom of God, he notes that it is largely related to private life. Where does it ever, or where it does whatever it can to protect its members from the onslaught of aggressive secularism that is increasingly dominant in secular society today? And guess what? Secular humanism is now in political power mm. in the United States, not only in Washington, D.C., but in most of the universities in this country. And other places, and, and public school systems. Yes. So how much of the kingdom do we currently have? Mm -hmm. It depends upon your eschatological view. Yes. At least would you now agree that there are major problems with how we are handling or mishandling the central teaching of Jesus. And there is more that we will pick up on in our next video next week. Thank and if I were you, <laughs> how's that go? I wouldn't want to miss <laughs> that next video. <laughs> Thank you, John. That was video number 123, titled Why So Important. We're going to finish that subject next week. So that was like a part one. Next week will be the same subject, Why So Important. And we'll finish out the discussion. Uh, if some of you have been here since the beginning, and some of this sounds familiar, we went over some of this stuff in the very first videos that we did. Yeah, two and three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but it's always good to have a refresher. And um, to me, one of the most important things you can do when you try to share something with someone is, is to make it relevant to them. So if, if it doesn't seem relevant, I think I read somewhere someone said one time, like you could uh, see a newspaper article that somebody found a cure to some unknown disease. I got, uh-huh, yeah, okay. 
because what else? But you tell that man first that he's got that disease and it's incurable. <laughs> and then in the next breath, he said, but we just found a cure for it. He's going to want to know all about that cure. <laughs> so um, this is a, for me. Well, a you know, that's a great analogy because there is a cure. Yeah, there is. People don't and that it. cure is not just salvation. No, no. Salvation is part of it, but that's part not, it. yeah. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> if you think I look silly laughing all the time and cutting up and being silly with John, it's because I'm happy. I mean, I have my bad days just like you do. Well, John does. We all do. But in my heart, I'm joyful and I'm at peace about the world and about things and and I'm human, I have my, my problems, but I tell you, I'm just basically a very happy person. Uh, I have a, a wonderful relationship with the Lord. Uh, I'm so blessed. And uh, it's, it just, this, this is the, the, the things we're learning here and knowing where we stand in the stream of time and what, you know, knowing what not to worry about <laughs> versus things that people want to worry about. It has such a wonderful effect on your soul. <laughs> so if this sounds good to you, I'd say stay tuned because we've got a lot more to share. And I think that if you, uh, if you pray about it and God's Spirit witnesses to you that what you're hearing is truth, it'll make all the difference in the world to the way you see life today and the rest of your life. So come back and see us. God bless you. We'll see you then. All right.